Welcome to all of those of you who are present uh, physically and, and also virtually. Um, I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the history of the, the T.D. Walter Bean professorship and, and, and to acknowledge uh, the, the, the generosity uh, of, of T.D. Uh, this is the 18th version of the T.D. Walter Bean professorship in, in the environment. Uh, it was created in 1994 to honor Walter Bean, who was a local businessman, philanthropist, and environmentalist whose dedication to the community lives on through the series of trails that bear his name. So those of you who are part of the Kitchener-Waterloo uh, community will, will know the Walter Bean Trail quite well, uh, and, and it bears his name. We're also pleased this evening that we have uh, Walter Bean's son and grandson, Judge Douglas Bean and Jeffrey Bean with us. So. Uh, th that's a, a great pleasure to be able to, to have the Bean family represented here this evening. This pro professorship, since it was created, has rotated uh, among three Waterloo faculties that have a strong interest in the environment. That is the Faculty of Science, the Faculty of Environment, and the Faculty of Engineering. Uh oh. <laughs> they said that. Picture would never appear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And, and so this professorship uh, seeks to promote Walter Bean's legacy of community involvement and commitment to youth and education and to bring to campus outstanding leaders and authorities in a variety of environmental fields in order to enhance the teaching and research programs at Waterloo. And as I mentioned, this endowed professorship is generously supported by the TD Bank Group. And we are all extremely grateful to TD for ongoing and generous support to this program. And in order to recognize TD, we thought we'd do something in a means that was uh, befitting of the subject of tonight's lecture. And let's see if we can make this work. Forests aren't just beautiful, they're essential to our health and well-being. They're where we live, work, and play. Forests give us a place for healthy recreation, an opportunity to connect with nature and rest our minds. They are the lungs of the earth. They clean the air and moderate temperatures. They provide employment. They provide habitat for wildlife. For some, they're a spiritual place. Forests are a big part of who we are, an iconic symbol of our North American story. We still have a wealth of forest in North America, but urban growth and development are increasingly putting them at risk. When we asked people within our North American footprint if they felt forests were important, more than 90% said yes, and more than 90% felt forests need to be protected. We took this to heart, and in 2012, we launched TD Forests. The program is aimed at growing urban forests and protecting critical forest ecosystems. In the first two years of the program, our employees helped plant almost 90,000 trees in and around urban centers through TD Tree Days. And through TD Green Streets, we've provided grants to help green more than 40 communities. We've also helped to protect almost 25,000 acres of critical North American forest through the Nature Conservancy of Canada and the Nature Conservancy in the U.S. TD Forests also promotes sustainable forestry and the responsible use of paper and forest products. Our customers asked us to use less paper, so we set a goal to reduce paper use at TD by 20%. TD Forests is part of our ongoing environmental leadership and our commitment to our customers, our employees, and the communities where we live and work. Because we believe forests are an essential part of life, now and for future generations. To learn more, visit tdforests.com. Okay, uh, please join me in thanking TD both for its interest in the environment and its support of this professorship. And now it's my pleasure to call upon the Vice President Academic and Provost of the University of Waterloo to introduce tonight's lecture.
Thank you, Terry. Well, this is my first opportunity to host the TD Walter Bean Professorship. And I want to share with you that the TD Walter Bean public lecture tonight is the final piece of what has been an extraordinary two-week program led by Dr. Tom Stolgren. This professorship has included academic presentations, research collaboration, and high school workshops. And this year, we have, for the first time, conducted elementary school presentations. At the University of Waterloo, we recognize that scientific curiosity starts very early. The University of Waterloo, as many of you know, is Canada's most innovative university and has been recognized as such for the past two decades. Tonight, we complement innovation with invasions. I'm pleased to be able to introduce Professor Tom Stolgren and his talk, Invasions from Inner Space. Tom is recognized as one of the top 10 most productive scientists in the world in the field of biological invasions. He is the senior scientist at the Natural Resource Ecological Laboratory in Colorado State University and director of the National Institute of Invasive Species and has published more than 200 scientific papers. <clears throat> Tom is United States Geological Survey liaison to the National Ecological Observatory Network and helps on issues related to biological sampling and scaling. He also directs the National Institute of Invasive Species Science. Tom has a YouTube channel which hosts his educational series on ecological science and nature's creepy stories of invasion, better known as CSI. He has published five novels, written five screenplays, and has a three-act comedy play, which I am told he is not performing tonight, <laughs> although there may be some comedy. And yes, Tom wears a Hawaiian shirt every single day. It saves making that so important decision every morning. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Tom Stolgren. Thank you very much. I'm humbled by this uh, big audience, maybe the biggest I've had, but I never get nervous. All right, um, yeah, in a moment, no, so, I've really had a great week and a half, to almost two weeks here. I've particularly enjoyed uh, meeting the youngsters in the community. That's right, I went to teach to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Oh, that was fun. Seventh and eighth graders, and then a room of 450 high school kids. Terrorizing? No, it was great fun. <laughs> And I'm going to have some fun today. I used to think, growing up, that the biggest thing I had to worry about was an invasion from outer space. I love those Hollywood movies where something would show up, a flying saucer, and all of a sudden it would zap forests and, and zap people. And, oh man, why had to worry about invasions? But I'm going to talk about a different kind of UFO today. All kinds of UFOs. But first I want to thank very much the University of Waterloo for hosting me, the TD Bank Group for sponsoring this event, and to the UW staff because they've really made me feel at home, uh, and I really like that. I mean, I, I had friends before I showed up. They were so careful about sending emails and making me feel welcome. So I'm especially thankful for uh, David Timms and Bonnie Fretz who just made me family. So this is me. When I got out of college, I was wearing this wolf shirt, and I was determined to save the world, to save the wolves. Because when I got out of college, about 50% of the wolves that died, died from a bullet. I thought that was unfair. So, oh, and the beautiful lady next to me uh, is still the beautiful lady ne next to me. Uh, so we've been together 43 years. No, no, no. She's a saint. <laughs> We've managed to raise a family in between, just a little bit about myself. And there's my uh, daughter in the middle. She's a, a physician in Texas. My new son-in-law, Stephen, uh, between us. My lovely bride, 
uh, Cindy, and then Connor and Michael, my two feral sons. <laughs> They're extremely wild, but not boring. And every day I'm out saving the world. This is me in Rocky Mountain National Park, where they had to put up fences so that the vegetation could recover from overgrazing of elk because there are no longer wolves to chase the elk away, to eat some elk. So this many years later, I have not succeeded in saving the wolves. But I am convinced that my life is still, still has meaning, I think, because in the back of my mind, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to save it every day. Some, think of something you can do to help save the world. So that's what drives me. I don't always dress right. I know that. <laughs> This, at, I do wear a Hawaiian shirt every day and a half for 30 years, but on Halloween, I get to add to it. <laughs> this was an ugly costume contest. Guess who won? <laughs> I gave lectures one Halloween in my white nose bat syndrome costume. White nose bat syndrome had killed more than 8 million bats in the United States. So I thought it was important that the students saw that I cared. This was my of course, you can guess, pizza on earth. <laughs> I know, if you look careful, you see my last will and testament there, so it was, of course, pizza on earth, goodwill toward man. That was a stretch. This year's costume, I was the answer to a multiple choice test question. That's right, I was E, none of the above. But I leave the office every day. This is me leaving on the first day of school saying, I'm going to save the world. And when I come home every day, I swing open the door and say, I saved the world today. I may have to go back tomorrow. <laughs> but that's what I want us to think about. A culture, a culture, a whole culture of I want to save the world. Just a little bit of it. <coughs> And that's why when I uh, got out of school and I started hiking around national parks, I was alarmed in the US, for example, that I saw Europe everywhere I went. This is my favorite postcard from Grand Tetons National Park in Wyoming. It says, the valley floor takes on many colors during the spring and summer. <laughs> yeah, because of the musk thistle from Europe, the red bromes from Europe, and the yellow sweet clover from Europe. Well, I don't go to my national parks to see Europe. And when we lose a little bit of our biological integrity, we lose a little bit of our cultural integrity. It's no longer just us. And some of these things are outcompeting native species. Some of these are stealing pollinators from our native plants. So I'm convinced native species are worth saving. And to do that, we have to take a far better look at the UFOs, the unwanted foreign organisms that have come in and are changing our world. We have, they either, so the definition of an invasive species, they harm our economy, they harm the environment, or they harm human health. That's pretty easy. And if, if a species is doing those things, we probably want to minimize those effects. And we have the Asian carp, the brown tree snake on Guam, Asian mosquitoes that are coming in, bringing us a new disease, chikungunya. I just like saying it, <laughs> chikungunya. <laughs> we have the uh, snakehead fish. We have um, Argentine fire ants, the cane toad, and the killer bee, the Africanized honeybee. That's actual size. No, it's only, they're only this big. But sometimes they could attack a person's head in groups of 80,000. Don't worry, if you get less than 1,500 bites, you might survive. And most people do. They usually, even when a big attack, they, they really maim people. They should be the African maiming bee. Okay, so here's the little talk. The outline of the talk is this. I'm going to give you a brief history of the world as I see it. It won't take very long. Then we'll talk about how invasive species research can help native species. 
and they can help the economy, and they can help human health. As we move to a time period where we start doing ecological forecasts, and then I'll talk a little, a brief assessment of Canadians' invasive species issues, just some of them. I'm going to tell you about my hope for the future, the NGOSs, the next generation of scientists, and there are many in the audience today. And then I'll give you a little bit of a prescription of the future and what I learned from a seventh and eighth grader while I was here. So this is my bias and my brief history of the world. 170 million years ago, all the continents were together. There's been climate change, say, over the past million years. It's gone up and down, up and down, up and down. There have been periods where it's warmer than this, and a lot of periods that were colder than this. If you don't like global warming, you're sure not going to like the next ice age. In the last 12,000 years, there's the dotted line about where we are today. We had the little ice age. We're coming out of it now. But we've had periods that were warmer than today, during the Holocene maximum. Oh, there we go. Periods that were warmer than today and periods where the rate of change was probably faster than today. We came screaming out of the ice age, according to the ice cores. Species survived some of these things. They have survived most of these things. And there's been climate change in the last 80 years. It's silly to deny it. I'll tell you right off the bat, it's silly to deny climate change. There's a hockey stick at the end there. Statistically, it goes up. And you're wrong if you're betting. You're probably wrong. There's a probability of about 3% that you're right. But there's a 97% chance you're wrong if you're saying climate change doesn't exist. It probably does, statistically. But that's the imports line behind it. And imports during my lifetime have gone up 40-fold. A 40-fold increase in trade and transportation. So what we've done in just 60 years is we've brought all the continents back together again. Now we're all we're trading around organisms left and right. This is another view of it now from a trade and transportation perspective. As soon as our continents got pretty far apart, our species were somewhat isolated. They were living the good life in their own continents. But something changed. We had an age of exploration. Columbus and boats started sailing around the world. And in the last 150 years, more and more boats have gone around the world. And they brought back all kinds of things. And again, in the last 60 years, we've had that exponential increase in trade and transportation. And then something happened in the lifetime of the students here. E-commerce. In the last 20 years, we have now made every laptop computer in every home a port. You can go online today, and you can buy an invasive species and have it mailed to your home. Trust me, you can buy the seeds to some of these African grasses that'll spread all over. Not so tough. So that's the world as I see it. We brought the continents back together again, and now we have a sample size of one, one globe, and we have changed the way plants and animals have to do business. We've changed food webs. We've changed ecology. But it goes back even before the 500 years I, I, I used the age of exploration. But think about the Polynesians. Okay, they, they would load up, a, load up a rowboat with 20 to 30 people in the, in the boat. They'd get to an island, and right away, what would happen? Well, it turns out that about 1,000 bird species went extinct in this 1,300-year period. What? What? 1,300 bird species? Or 1,000 bird species in 1,300 years? They tasted like chicken. <laughs> they were slow. They hadn't seen predators before. We were novel. So yeah, things went extinct. They weren't setting up national parks. They were eating good. And when I started looking at extinction, 
in the different places around the world, you could pretty much, archaeologists can tell you when we showed up by the body counts in the bone beds. So it's no mystery that founding populations, all it takes is a few people to arrive on a spot, and founding populations are enough to drive species into extinction. And then we take over with some armaments, and things e even start going up a little faster. In some cases, the passenger pigeon, there we are, uh, the Tasmanian wolf, Spanish ibex, and the great auk. I always have to point out, because Dave Timms is in the audience, and, and he has a Scottish family, that some of the great auks died uh, because a group in Scotland thought they were witches. <laughs> Funny. But not so funny is how it continues, how our rifles are mowing down species at an incredible rate. So look up the numbers on rhinos, and it's frightening, and elephants, things with ivory, things that we can use that, that become really rare, and that's what's happening. We're better than this. Now let's look at extinction events. And it did, again, it didn't take too many people. This is a story of Guam, and I'm going to come back to this story because it's so cool. But in uh, the 1950s, it was just one or two cargo ships that brought a brown tree snake to Guam. And what happened is the brown tree snake found a lot of good eating. A lot of birds that probably tasted like chicken. Twelve species went extinct. And I thought, boy, that's on land. How about Lake Victoria in Africa, where this beautiful lake, in a big lake in Africa, had 400 to 500 cichlid species, our tropical fish that we see in aquarium all over the place. Beautiful tropical fish. But then in the 1950s, a couple people brought in a Nile perch. That's got to be like a saber-toothed tiger to those fish. That's a big creature. And so, more than 200 species became extinct or very rare because we played with nature. And it just didn't take very many of us. It only took a few to change the way that lake did business. And on the age of exploration, when we caught up, we realized that we had something in common with the black rat. We both control about 90% of the Earth. <laughs> Oh, there's our partner. Uh, and we both carry disease where we go. But we not only carry disease, if you looked on the ship's manifest, that sailing all around the world at the time, they brought humans, human diseases, rats and mice. They brought pigs, goats, sheep, and horses and rabbits. In fact, all but the horses would be let off. They'd let off a few of them on different islands so that when they came back, they could get more food. They would reproduce. But the rats went with them. And then they brought insect pests, better hunting and fishing technology, agriculture and crops, and pets. Cats. I'll talk about cats a little later. But the disease issue really had me frightened when I read some of the numbers. How easy is it to wipe out a people? It's not that hard. Not with an outbreak. You can have a few infected people on a boat that can wipe out millions of people on the land they arrive at. And as many as 10 or 20 million first peoples died from different flus and smallpox and measles. More died from disease than by bullets. Oh, we may have helped finish them off with bullets and moving them to less productive sites. But there were also meltdowns associated with this outbreak and with many others today. And a meltdown is when one invasive species helps another one move around. And this disease might have been helped, smallpox may have been helped out a bit by the Spanish horses that were released around the 1500s in South America. They had moved north. And now a diseased person can get on a horse and they could ride hundreds of miles. So by delivering that disease hundreds of miles away, 
many more could become infected at a much faster rate. And I think this was probably involved or likely involved. It's not that far-fetched when you think about exchanging that horse with a bus driver today or a pilot in a plane and how we move around flus and SARS and many other diseases, Ebola, patients have flown on planes. So we move things around greatly right now. So what happened when we dropped off all those animals on islands? When we look at what happened, looking back and doing the body counts, there was an initial extinction process right up here. And so the things that tasted like chicken went first. But then the rats and the cats and everything else that were on the island started to multiply. And as they multiplied and they got hungry, then extinction sort of peaked around the 1900s and it's actually been on a little bit of a decline since then. Nice. That's, that's pretty good news, really, that decline part. And we look at bird extinctions. So this top group looked at mammals and birds and another group looked at birds and they said, you know, we can't find any evidence of a bird going extinct by natural processes. It was all humans or the species we brought with us. We brought avian bird flu uh, to the island of Hawaii and a lot of those honey creepers went extinct. So when you look at the numbers, islands look like they were taking the biggest hit with about 95% of the extinctions caused by humans or the species that we brought. And on land, on, con on the continents, it looks like most were caused by hunting. but they forgot about the freshwater species. And when we add in the freshwater species, the numbers kind of shift a little bit. I'm worried about our aquatic ecosystems. I really do worry about them. Because 123 freshwater animals in North America have gone extinct since 1900. That's a big number. A lot of them early in the 1900s, they think. And if you count in the 250 plus extinct cichlid species in Lake Victoria, all of a sudden we have more species going extinct on continents, not islands. And what have we done to my favorite wolves? Remember the t-shirt? I'm still involved. I've got to save them somehow. Well, we're pushing them north, or we're pushing them into smaller and smaller areas. And today, 50% of the wolves that escape from Yellowstone National Park die of bullets. But we're pushing them north. Grizzly bears, pushing them north. Bison, into little tiny areas. Not the whole 40 million herds that we, 40 million animal herds that we've heard about in the past. Little tiny enclaves now. Bighorn sheep, as soon as you bring domestic sheep close to bighorn sheep, we transfer lungworm, pink eye, and a bunch of other diseases to the bighorn sheep and the bighorn sheep plop over. And for us, there's good news and bad news. Here and across the border, we did a number on them until about 1920, but since 1920, things are starting to come back. Forests will regrow. Bears not so much on a site after they've been shot. So here's how I look at history and what we've done. We had a lot of na native species that were common. It used to be common to see grizzly bears, wolves, bighorn sheep, yellow-legged frogs, boreal toads, some native fishes in different lakes. Those used to be common. Now they're rare. And on the common side, we have alien species, non-native species, that we've brought in instead. So now we have to protect our domestic sheep and our cattle we bring frogs around, bullfrogs that carry kitcher disease. We also get frogs from uh, the pet industry where 50% of them are carrying this kitcher disease and we, somehow we help spread this around the globe. And we've moved trout almost everywhere. Incredible numbers of trout have been moved into other places. And they're big eaters. 
They're like saber-toothed tigers in streams. So now, what are we going to do about this? Well, if these invasive species are harmful somehow to the economy, to the environment, or to human health, we want to minimize their effects. And if we're going to minimize their effects, we need some help. We need to start thinking about the processes involved. One of the processes I liked was this sort of intuitive one. They said, well, what's really hurting our forests? Is it climate change? Is it cutting them down? And they found out, for the most part, climate has a small effect on species distributions where they are now. It will change in the long run, but right now and over the short term, other things become more important, like the insect pests we brought in, the emerald ash borer, the gypsy moth. And the diseases are even worse because they don't know how to compete with the diseases. An elm will come up and then get hammered back by Dutch elm disease. Or chestnut blight will attack a tree that's this big and quickly knock it back. So they were used to the axe. They could actually get, come back with seeds. But now they're not coming back from these alien diseases, these UFOs, these unwanted forest organisms. So now, we're starting to develop risk maps. We're starting to use our maps to say, hey, this, these little genotypes survived the disease. Let's plant these genotypes. So we're hunting. We're using these maps to find the survivors. This is so cool. Because if you plant the survivors, they might live. Smart. I love it. I'm trying to outthink the disease genetically about moving big fish. We took a big lake trout, somebody did in 1975, and thought Yellowstone Lake needed a lake trout. This wasn't a whole lot of people. This was a, probably a couple of foolish people. Well, what happened? The cutthroat trout started disappearing that were in the lake to begin with. The native trout started slowly disappearing. What's wrong with that? They still got fish to fish for, right? Well, it turns out that the lake trout likes to survive deep in the water, and the cutthroat trout like the upper layers and like to go up the streams where the bald eagle and the grizzly bear can get it. And those bald eagles and grizzly bears just can't get after that food source if it's down way deep in the lake. So they're not identical replacements. What are they doing? They're tracking the fish with little sensors now. They catch some, release them, and they're finding out their little secret territories, their home bases, and they're going after them. Then they bring in the sonar, and they map those areas, and that's where they dedicate their fishing efforts with nets and all kinds of things. So we're using them, the lake trout, to catch them. I love that story kind of getting even. Now about the python in the Everglades. This was my favorite one to show the kids to, around, uh, around town. So if you're a python owner, you know, you can go to your pet shop and get a python and you'll own it for a little while and then as it becomes a teenager, <laughs> as the python becomes a teenager, it gets picky and it no longer wants to eat the little mice you've been feeding it. It wants bigger food, and it gets cranky, and it snaps at you, and it's no longer fun to hold. And so what do some pet owners do, some thoughtless a few pet owners do? They release it back to nature. <laughs> they give it back to the good earth, Everglades National Park. Well, it wasn't long before Adam found Eve, and now there's about 100,000 pythons in the Everglades. I know, right? <laughs> Just took a few, few people. Well, they did road surveys of rabbits before and after. <laughs> it's tough to be a rabbit these days. <laughs> Almost as bad being a raccoon and they can run and scratch and everything else. Bossums, oof, not so good. Bobcats? 
these big fellas will eat a deer. They'll eat a five-foot alligator. One ate a five-foot alligator. You're going to love this story. One ate a five-foot alligator, and the snake couldn't digest it, big snake. So he goes up on land and lets the sun help him digest the alligator. But the alligator, native species, says, "Uh uh-uh, no siree, Bob. It was dead. And it waited for that sun to beat on him, and it swelled up. Kaboom. So they're using telemetry to find those snakes now. They're tagging them, and they're moving them around. It's a really good story. They are jumping on it, but they got a little late start. i got to tell you that. And it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle, but we have some really smart people working on how. And that's where um, uh, my research team tries to develop mathematical models to help predict where these things are going to go in space and in time. The space part's a little easier. We can take some data from the field, load it into our any kind of POM device, work it into our models with, that will use slope, elevation, aspect, all kinds of GIS layers in between, and then pull out a probability map. And we can test that probability map with future data. We can verify our model, or we can withhold some of the data and test it back and forth so that we have a level of certainty and uncertainty associated with different parts of the model. So now we're starting to make predictions because I'm dreaming of a day when you turn on your TV at night and you not only get a weather forecast, you get a biological forecast soon afterwards. (laughs) Here's what's invading your area tonight. (laughs) Don't laugh, it's gonna happen. So what we used the models for of the snakes really quickly was that we said, okay, here it is right now. But if you live in the green zone, don't let your pet loose. It just might survive. Give a whole new meaning to puppy chow in that area. So don't set your pet loose if you're in the green zone. If you're above the green zone, it's probably too cold. It won't live too long, but it could still scare a few people before that. But we have to be conscious now as pet owners not to release things back to nature. A snake, sure, that's no problem, right? But even tossing out that dead frog could continue that chytrid disease long after you toss out the frog. Our group was given the task of uh, taking the first 56 points of Asian carp and saying, where might it go? Now that's a daunting task. So we did our little model and um, we handed it off saying, you know, I would worry a little bit about the Great Lakes. It looks like at least some areas might be suitable habitat. And if it gets there, we know it's going to change the food web and help ruin a billion dollar fishery, a multi-billion dollar fishery. Somebody can correct me on the numbers right now. I'm going to come back to this because I'll show you how close we came to the... (laughs) almost the real answer a little later. But our group also works to improve models any way we can. In this case, improving the resolution using different climate layers. Now they're better than they were when we first started just 10 years ago. So now our models are getting a little bit more precise and we think we're going to be able to help people on the ground find the leading edges of the invader and going out and getting them right then. That'll save us a lot more money. I modeled the human invader. I have to tell this story because I'm very proud that this paper got rejected by four journals. <laughs> I compared us to bulldozers and fire ants right there in the abstract. Apparently, they didn't, see the, they didn't have a sense of humor. Um, but here was the thing. We took Landsat imagery from two time periods, and we said, what portion of our forests and our grasslands were being converted to urban sites? over that period. It turns out 7.5% of the U.S. was converted in that nine-year period, an area the size of Massachusetts. So we're, making an, we're having an impact. And then what? Well, then we do bring in the bulldozers, and we almost always landscape our home with invasive species that are sold at our lo- local nursery. Some are windborne, some are carried by birds, some seeds, but they escape, like a biological pollutant. We don't realize it. We didn't plant the natives. 
Oops. And then we bring in cats, and we let them out the door. And it turns out cats kill a billion birds a year. If you own a cat, don't let it out. <laughs> Look at this cat. This is a cat in Australia. Let loose, along with foxes, and now they're throwing this little one numbat into extinction and several other species. What do you say to a cat this big? Here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> they eat big. They terrorize animals in the outdoors. Think about the honeybees that we see around us. Now, it didn't take very many people to bring honeybees in. In fact, a few pilgrims did brought the European bee in in 1622. It spread very rapidly across the US and across Canada. It didn't take that many people to introduce the bees. Once they were introduced, they found a really good home, despite the fact we have hundreds of species right here. But then something else happened. Then, down here in Brazil, in a lab, they crossed an African bee with a European bee. It's a hybrid to make better honey and to do a little better job in, in uh, South, South America. But what happened? It escaped. Oh, geez, I hate that. And it escaped and raced through South America and raced through Central America, and now it's pushing its way up north. Where will it stop? Oh, I have the answer to that. That's where it comes into ecological forecasting. Remember, here's our weather today. We can learn a lot from climate scientists. They are used to mapping and modeling things in space and time, temperature and precipitation, but in space and time. Now, we have textbooks on spatial analyses, and we have textbooks on time series analyses, but we don't have a textbook yet on spatial and temporal analyses. But we're going to get there. We're going to move in that direction. And we're going to solve issues that are pretty darn important when we do that. So we add in future layers into our models. Short term, I never like to make I, uh, guesses about what might happen in 2100. I won't be there for you to rub my nose in it if I'm wrong. But I will go out a little ways. I like short-term projections to think about how things might move over the short period. And so we did that. We do that with kudzu. Kudzu is this nice vine we brought in on purpose. We put out in the landscape on purpose for erosion in the south, southern part of the US, and it escaped. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. And this vine takes over. And so our first maps and models said, oh, this is a generalist. I mean, I don't think climate's going to stop this thing at all. But then we got clever and we started looking at areas of uncertainty where our models may not be telling us the truth. So we started mapping uncertainty, giving maps with error bars. I thought this was a new improvement. Oh, and then we also found that some of the climates we were testing were outside the range that the species had had uh, evolved with. So we said, we're not going there. We're not going to mess with that. Those areas we can't tell you about yet. Sorry, northern uh, Canada. We can't tell you if Kudzu's going to get there. And at least it, it probably won't in that short period I'm talking about. And we have ways of investigating individual factors to see which ones are most important in this model. And so we can start targeting those areas on the ground. That's where it comes in handy. We can look at areas that, are, that could be increasing in kudzu or where it's going to uh, spread faster. Now, people will pay us. They'll pay us to do climate change models. It's a hot topic. I'm not knocking climate change. They'll pay us to look at the distribution of African fountain grass now and where it might be in 2040. But I'm laughing as I'm picking up my check. Why? because they sell it in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And while climate change may move a species at five kilometers a year, a Walmart truck or a big box truck can move it around at 500 kilometers a day. 
It's us. It's trade and transportation that moves things around. It's getting on a website and ordering something. It's going to your local uh, uh, nursery and buying something that maybe shouldn't be in your area. So now let's do a little brief assessment of Canada's uh, species issues, invasive species issues. And I started with this very early model of Asian carp. And what we found out was in the 2013 assessment of where it was, our models matched up pretty good. The Chesapeake Bay interestingly lit up. And it turns out that today I saw an article where two new giant carp species are invading the Chesapeake Bay that lived in also the southern part of the Mississippi. It's just one of those climate matching things that matched up well for a big invasive species, uh, aquatic species. So yes, I'm very worried that this is going to get to the Great Lakes. And when it does, the fishery. What worries me more is that we didn't see this coming, that somehow we let a group of fish farms in the southern Mississippi bring in the carp so that it can take away their um, moss or whatever it was that they brought in the fish for. Somehow we weren't smart enough to know. We had not done our homework to evaluate risk of the things we were letting loose in our world. I hope we become smarter than this. You have a little issue with the Emerald Ash Borer, and it's costly. Here's where it hits the pocketbook. Because last year, it was about $25,000 in expenditures to remove the trees hit by the Emerald Ash Borer. This year, it's going to be $100,000. And over 10 years, $3 million. One city, one invasive species. Do the math. Now, that's money that could be set aside for some other things, education, parks, other things. So we have to understand our opportunity costs. By letting some species go early, we have to pay a bigger price later on. Now, sure, we can model the emerald ash borer. We didn't do these models for a very good reason. Because I knew that in a nursery in New Brunswick, you can go there and you can buy some ash trees along with some ginkgo trees from Asia. Now, these have been in the nursery together. I wonder if a bug might move from one to another in the nursery. I wonder if someone could be taking away a couple of trees that carry that emerald ash borer as they leave that one nursery. This was the first one I looked at online. But if you went online today, my guess is you can find the same situation almost everywhere. You can pick live species up, and you're not sure if they're carrying hitchhikers. And whose job is it to check? But how else do we move around the emerald ash borer in Toyota pickups? We move firewood, sometimes from a woodlot, sometimes from the next county. But we move firewood around. And when we move firewood around, especially this big, you can bet some of it is carrying an invasive species. How do I know that? Well, we just did a couple of studies. Not us, but somebody else did. And I looked at the results, and they said, you know, if you're moving even commercial firewood that's somewhat packaged and sometimes kilned and sometimes treated, but even those best-case scenarios, 50% of those bundles have an invasive organism in them. And we move them. Let's take some firewood camping. We don't think about it. We've got to start thinking about it. And boats. Not everyone washes their boat. Suppose 99 out of 100 people wash their boat of zebra mussels before they go to their next lake. This was an article in Richmond, British Columbia in the news this last month, and it said, boy, we're only hoping that, they, what do they call them, the snowbirders? Yeah, snowbirds, those people that go on vacation during those nice cold weeks, and they take their boat with them, and they may bring back a present or two for the next lake they visit. 
So this is very common. Next, we have Asian bird flu, probably on the way. It's a difficult disease. We can't make a lot of predictions about it right now. And that's because it involves wild ducks, domestic ducks or local ducks, poultry farms, and then long distance migrants, birds that fly thousands of miles. And they contribute genes to this disease as they spread it amongst themselves. And it doesn't take much for it to move into a very harmful strain that's really, really bad for humans. And it just hasn't happened yet. We're sort of lucky that the ducks and the wild geese and the long migration birds haven't come in contact that much yet. But I think it might be a matter of time, and I'd start working on vaccines right away. And we concentrate things. It's not just about invasive species. This is another February 2nd, 2015, a little story from National Geographic. And they were proud of the technology. This is pretty nice. They have a, a fake falcon that's solar powered that flaps his wings to scare the ducks away from the tar sands, tar oil sands, to other areas. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to concentrate ducks. <laughs> and it just may help. It may be that one little key that tosses the Asian bird flu into this tiny little thing into that outbreak or meltdown. OK. Why am I not worried? <laughs> Shouldn't I be worried? I'm not worried. I'm a total optimist about this. And I'll tell you why. Because we have the next generation of scientists, the NGOSs, who are a lot smarter and faster than I am, and that we are collectively. They're really smart kids, and I met several of them right here in town. And I want to tell you the story of an island we almost wrote off, Guam. There's Guam. Remember, it had the 12 species of birds, beautiful birds, the Marianas fruit dove and the Guam rail. I told this to the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade class. So I'm telling it to you the same way I, I, I told it to them. And before 1950, there were 25 species of birds happily moving around the island. They had survived hunting, World War II, DDT, <laughs> and land clearing for agriculture. They survived all of those things. What they couldn't survive was that little cargo ship that brought in a couple of um, snakes. Tree snakes, that kind of predator they didn't know how to deal with, right there in the canopy. So 12 species of birds were extirpated from the island. Eight others declined more than 90%, and two others are, are severely reduced. Ah! Right? I hate snakes. I got to tell you. I did that to the kids, and they, they actually <laughs> they, they jumped a little bit. But I was there to talk about food webs, because I'm an ecologist. So I say, oh, you know, it was really a nice story before, uh, before the tree snake arrived. The, the bird ate the, the uh, berries from the tree and spread the seeds around so there could be lots of baby trees. It really worked great. But now there's no birds, so the trees are having a little tougher time regenerating. And when the snake finished the birds off, it started taking out the invasive geckos and rats. All of a sudden, I get pumped up. Hey, that's good news, right? Invasive geckos and rats, they're gone now too? Well, kind of good news. Good news and bad news because now spider densities without the geckos are up 40 times. <laughs> so now we have an island that's filled with snakes and spiders. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but I'm not worried. Because the next generation of scientists is on the job. Young people are signing up to do their duty to help bring that island back. And they have a lot of work to do. Isn't that creepy? I don't know. Why is she happy? She's happy because she's saving the globe. She's saving the world. That's a good thing. And they're developing different traps and different smells that might attract the snakes. Very clever, these people. 
and dogs that hunt them down and snap at them. But the dogs don't climb trees, so they can only get a few of them. Then they came upon this. Now, I got to tell you, when you're giving this talk to, to third, fourth, and fifth graders, it's kind of fun to do because I, I do the little parachuting mice. Some chemists found out that Tylenol, 83 milligrams of Tylenol, will kill a brown tree snake. Yeah, who knew? They tested all kinds of things, and they found out Tylenol is the magic bullet. That'll take them out. How do you deliver the Tylenol? With lab mice and little parachutes. So little mice are, are getting dropped out of a helicopter thinking, <laughs> I made it. I made it. Then the brown tree snake eats them. The brown tree snake drops to the forest floor. And that's how he got that giant bundle. Yeah. I'm not worried because there's this kind of curiosity and ingenuity in the world. We won't rest. We won't ride off an island. We won't ride off a territory. We won't ride off a county. We can do it if we put our minds to it. And so the snakes have plummeted in the areas that they tested this parachuting mice thing. And the Guam rail has come back. How do you feel if you're a kid and you're out there doing your first research program and you get the report that you saw the, the rail come back? And yes, the Marianas fruit dove. Not all of them, but a few came back. We can do this. Curiosity and ingenuity can do this. We have other, uh, I could have bragged about dozens of, of the NGOS is the next generation of scientists. This is one of my favorite, a Crow student, a First Nation student from the Crow Reservation. They do a Sundance ceremony, and they were losing their cottonwood trees to invasion of Russian olive. So she mapped out a plan, modeled the Russian olive, and came together with the tribe, and they decided how they were going to remove the Russian olive to preserve the cottonwood species, not for the species, but for their cultural identity. Because if they don't perform, in their minds, if they don't perform the Sundance ceremony, the world doesn't rotate anymore. Whatever the reason, it's working. There's Catherine the Great. One, uh, I call her Catherine the Great. Catherine Jarnovich, just a world-class modeler now. She's worked on everything, and this one was killer bees, the Africanized bees, and sure enough, there's a little tip up here that it may reach under good conditions if things don't go as well as we hope they will. But we've got teams working on how we can reduce the numbers of Africanized bees. We have Sunil Kumar, who did more than dress up as the white nose bat syndrome guy. And he's actually developed the, the prediction maps of where the white nose bat syndrome is spreading so they can look out ahead of it and close off some caves so that humans don't hurt the site, bring in the disease by accident. We have Jim Graham, who's working not with invasive species, but with gray whales. He also works with invasive species. But I'm glad he showed this model, because it showed blue whales showing up eventually in the Mediterranean. They haven't been spotted there for 200 years. After he published the model, they saw a gray whale. They saw a gray whale in the Mediterranean. Not because he did the model, of course, <laughs> but it was suitable habitat. I love that story. And Greg Newman, who is working with citizen scientists around the globe to start citizen science projects where they record the data and they use the models and they all uh, they can see their data online. But here, here is where I saw the greatest concentration of NGOSs. You should be very proud. You got Heidi Swanson's class. You got the seventh and eighth graders at Edna Stabler. Yeah, oh, the graduate students. I was a member, almost a member of the grad house now. <laughs> I really like that place. 450 high school students. Kim Cuttington's class, the fourth and sixth grade class yesterday. You have a provost and deans that are active scientists. I had to underline that. It's not like that in other universities, folks. This is amazing. 
They're still doing science. I can go into my dean and talk about budgets or space, but not really science. And I got to chat with all of them about science, and that made me very happy. Okay, then I got to test some new equipment, a new startup called the Mayo. I had it on my wrist, and it's a way of, a way of controlling electronic devices just using hand motions. Oh, I said, I want one of these. I want two of them. I want two of them, one on each arm, and I want it hooked to Samsung's 3D glasses where you, you have an app on your phone, and I want a drone above me taking video, feeding it in to my 3D, and I want to be able to fly and point out invasive species that we can target. That's, that's all. <laughs> they sort of chuckled. You have one student. Sean, he says, how about this garden bot? It moves around on your lawn. Love this kid. And it plucks out the bad guys. It's just developing a prototype now, but I want one. And I want it bigger. <laughs> yeah. I want the truck size one that goes around and finds pythons in the Everglades. <laughs> plucks those baby Ryan out of there. I'm a huge fan of your knowledge integration department. Isn't that what we all learn to do eventually? Wouldn't it be great to have, I want to take this back to my university, see? Knowledge integration, that's a cool idea. That is a really good idea. Then, yesterday, I saw the village, this is the village green, the woodlot. I saw a place with so much potential. There were old growth species growing in here. You have a history, a hi nice history piece right here of Waterloo, right on that site. I'd make, I'd make a walkway. I'd use the cell towers to quickly beam in a story of what the species are I'm seeing and what wildlife I'm likely to see in that spot. I'd walk a little ways further and my new cell phone would pick up my new location and tell me what I'm seeing in this area. And every kid, every kid in Waterloo will want to take that hike and learn the whole time. And it's right in your backyard. I love that thing. So now a prescription for the future. I had this real complicated slide. I showed the fourth and fifth graders and I showed the high school kids and I lost them. Their eyes glossed over. If I was a scientist, I'd work on ecological forecasting and uh, models that scale to sky and space. And, and if I was a policymaker, I'd make sure that we had better prevention and early detection and effective regulations and monitoring. And then they said, well, what could, what, what, what could we do? <laughs> I thought, yeah. Yeah, what could you do? Well, we can stop blaming biodiversity loss on human population growth, climate change, and land use change. It's probably not the reason a lot of species have gone extinct in the last 30,000 years. Really, a relatively small number of humans are to blame. Irresponsible humans have caused most of our extinctions, moving species around where they shouldn't be, trading in things we shouldn't be trading in. And so she's... Oh my gosh. She says, yeah, I know, we got to focus, focus some attention on those irresponsible people and those offending industries. But really, the little girl raised her hand and says, we got to be better consumers. I added that. <laughs> yeah. What if we stopped buying live trade? What? What would it hurt? What if we stopped trading things around the globe that were going to cause harm, that we did a little risk? in a little upfront risk analysis first. Australia and New Zealand have a guilty until proven innocent way of trading. What about us? Come on in. We like to find out later. We can change that with a global conservation ethic. Just feeling like you want to contribute to making the world a better place. And then we want to encourage that next generation of scientists. No matter how young they are, encourage the science and the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, and have them put it to a purpose. Have them prove at the end of the day, 
I help save the world. My last line from Dr. Seuss, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you very much. I want that noted. <laughs> so my name's uh, Bernie Dunker. I'm Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Science. And Tom, thank you so much. Fantastic. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Um, <laughs> I, I particularly uh, appreciate the upbeat ending after scaring me to death with the, <laughs> the snakes and bees. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be first to line up for that snake bot. I think that's yes, a great, snake. great idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have uh, about 10 minutes or so now for some questions. Um, prevent the next ones. Uh, really, because we're, I think we're at the tip of the iceberg for trading things around the globe. So right now, Work on what you can. Uh, for example, um, for the, the sheep and the, the cow issue, I sort of became a vegetarian. So they don't have to shoot any wolves on my behalf. For the Asian carp one, maybe you volunteer to be on that team that starts yanking them out of the lake when they first get there. I mean, I, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Everyone would. Let's get the early ones if we can, any way we can. Um, for the zebra mussel, wash your boat. Stop moving them around because they're still spreading. We still have lakes without zebra mussels. Wash them every time. Get them inspected. Stop at the inspection places. Go out of your way to stop at an inspection place if there isn't one at the little lake that you're planning on going to. Um, become a better consumer. Think about those shrubs that you're going to plant next year uh, in your garden. Plant natives. Enjoy those native species and colors. They were here. Some are very beautiful. Next. Okay, I'm told we don't have mics up. That's good. <laughs> People have good voices. Shoot. Right. How do you stop an Africanized bee? Who? Well. Um, uh, that's a really good question, and the kids probably want to know this too. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you, if you are attacked by a bee... Not, like, like, not a person, but like, how does the government... Oh, stop it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good, that's, that's very different. That's a... Two, two different things. But first, I've got to tell you the comedy first, because it was, you started it. I, I, and I... <laughs> I already thought about it. Uh, so I, I told the high school kids, what if you have a pool that's uh, four meters away? Uh, do you run away from the bees, or do you jump in the pool if you're attacked? How many say jump in the pool? No, you don't jump in the pool. <laughs> They'll wait for you to come up. 80,000 of them. But if you run, you can outrun them if you run more than 40 meters. Just keep going. I would. <laughs> Maybe to the next town. OK, now on the realistic question, what do you do? How does the government stop these bees? Well, we start doing some research on how to attract them and how to stop them socially uh, in and around hives. We know that there are some um, native mites and diseases uh, that bees can get, but we haven't quite got the mites and diseases down yet where they are so specific that they'll target these hybrids. So that gene is a little tough one to get, but we're working on it. Some really smart people are working on how to stop these things uh, socially at the hive, protecting hives, uh, and protecting European queen bees that are in the hive. So I don't have a great answer yet, but I probably would in a couple years. The NGOSs are on it. Yes? What do you think about making your robot that kills the snakes really, really tiny small, and then you enter nanotechnology? 
Yes, nanotechnology. Uh, so what if we have little nano bees that are outside that recognize those African ones when they come up and pop them? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm a huge fan of making things small and light and that can move around because these things are very widespread. And so we may end up dropping these things uh, from a plane, right, over a, over a county. Uh, somehow that work as traps or that bring them in somehow or deliver a little dose of Tylenol or whatever it is that gets them. So Tom, we have a Twitter question. What do I do when I find an emerald ash borer in my back garden? Report it immediately. Uh, report that emerald ash borer immediately to the county supervisors. You should have a number to call if you went on an EAB website. There'll be a phone number. You report it right away, and don't you worry, they'll come and they'll chip your tree down to a little tiny little pile of... No, I don't know what they'll do, but that... Uh, I made that up. They probably have to do that, though. I mean, uh, they, do, they, they did that in, uh, in Detroit. They just came up and uh, whacked your tree. But, but, on the plus side, you knew in your heart you weren't spreading it to your neighbors. And you might replace that ash tree with a native tree that's going to last a lot longer, a different type that might last a lot longer, that you won't have to replace in five or ten years. So it might be cost efficient for you in the long term anyway. Okay, we have time for one more question. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Student. Sorry. <laughs> Saw the notebook. If you had a notebook, I would have gone there. <laughs> Is, our, our, is it our consumerism to blame? Or so are other countries experiencing? Experience. Yeah, so other countries are experiencing invasions. In fact, the Southern Hemisphere countries, uh, South America, Chile, Argentina, Aust Australia, they're getting hammered. Some of them have taken the much bolder steps in policy than we have, than Canada has as well. They said, you're guilty until proven innocent. We're not gonna let you in the country until you show us that this won't spread and harm the economy and, or harm the environment or harm human health? That's a very good question. I wish, I really wish we took on the Australian or New Zealand way of trading. They don't seem to be hurting that much and the trade-off might be okay in the long run. I gotta, I gotta end with one more story, killer story. Five times in the, in the last five months, they have intercepted an organism that comes from Africa and, and uh, it's a little beetle that comes from Africa and India. And people bring rice and beans when they travel sometimes. And in those rice and beans, they've intercepted five of these beetles. They will destroy rice crops, bean crops, and many other crops in our country if they get here. I see a picture of a gun and saying, hey, don't bring a gun on board. I would put the rice and the beans right underneath that. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. That's how to get me if you have any further questions. Send, shoot me an email. I, I, I just want to thank Tom one more time, though, for the fact that we're going to have enrollment growth in the next three to 10 years because of the new generation of NGOSs that we're going to see at Waterloo. So thanks again for coming, everyone.